just going to go ahead and refute the self-righteousness and sinless perfection heresy of, of Kerrigan Skelly. He's a street preacher and he basically just preaches Catholic heresies on salvation. He believes he is sinlessly perfect. He rejects eternal security. He says if you sin, you lose your salvation. So basically he turns salvation into this continual process of holiness and basically works like the Catholics do. He is uh, post-trib, which is very bad, very uh, wicked heresy. And he is non-dispensational. He does not use the King James Bible. He quotes from modern versions. All kinds of problems. He just, it just, he's a papist. And I say papist because he, he may not do the whole Mary thing, the whole Catholic idolatry, but his doctrine lines up with the papacy. But I'm going to go through some notes here on sinless perfection. Does the Bible teach sinless perfection? I'm going to have some points written down. So first of all, believers have two natures, the sinful flesh and the Holy Spirit. The sinful flesh and the Holy Spirit are constantly at war with each other. They're contrary to each other. And there's a constant battle to resist the sinful flesh. That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, 17. So if we can be sinless, why is there a constant war between the sinful flesh and the spirit? Because Christians have two natures. See, we have the flesh, we can fulfill the lust of the flesh, or we can live according to the spirit. In Romans chapter 7, verse 13 and 25, Paul talks about his struggle with sin and his struggle to resist the sinful flesh. Self-righteous papists like Skelly will try to say that that passage is Paul before his conversion. But this claim is easily, easily refuted in verse 25 of Romans 7, where Paul talks about serving the law of God, which he cannot do as a lost person. So Paul was clearly saved when he was talking about this, and he was talking about his struggle with the flesh. He wasn't talking about before his salvation. But self-righteous papists like, like uh, Skelly can't understand that because they're too prideful and self-righteous to admit that they're a sinner that has nothing without Jesus. They want to justify themselves. They, they cannot, they're prideful. They cannot admit they're sinners. So they have to say what Paul was talking about before his salvation. No, verse 25 proves that Paul was basically talking about his struggle with the flesh after his salvation because you cannot serve the law of God as a lost person. So my cat is just messing around back there. 1 Kings 8.46, 2 Chronicles 6.36, both say that there's no man that sinneth not. And Ecclesiastes 7.20 says there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Not one. There's no man that sinneth not. Our bodies are corruptible and will never be sinless until the rapture, properly called the catching away of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 54, Paul refers to our bodies as corruptible and makes clear that we only get incorruptible bodies at the rapture. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21, Paul says that our bodies are, quote, vile, my cat, and that our bodies will only be changed at the catching away. If Christians could live sinlessly perfect, then Paul would have been preaching heresy by calling our bodies corruptible and vile because our bodies would not be that way if we could be sinlessly perfect. So, going to get into refuting the heresies of Kerrigan Skelly. Just some points I wanted to bring up earlier about how the Bible does not teach we're sinlessly perfect, our bodies are corruptible, and we have the sinful flesh that we have to constantly resist. But, again, self-righteous papists like Skelly can't see that. So here's the first clip, and some clips I've gathered together, from a video he's trying to basically refute Calvinism, which of course Calvinism is heresy, but he's refuting basically this doctrine that Christians have a sin nature. So in the first clip, let's watch this. Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Here's the important part. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and I will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What's the condition for being pardoned, having mercy? Forsaking your wicked ways, your unrighteous thoughts. So obviously, you know, he goes back to the Old Testament. Uh, Skelly says that turning from sin and living holy is required for salvation. That's what he implies. And he runs back to a verse in the Old Testament to prove this Catholic heresy. The Old Testament, you know, he, he ran back to a verse under the law. Uh, we're not Jews under the law. So he's going back under the law to prove his work salvation heresy. These papists always have to do that. They have to go back under the law. They have to go to the future of the time of Jacob's trouble. They can't deal with the Pauline epistles. So, you know, already off to a rough start. But let's continue. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14. But 
above all these things, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Perfection. So Kerrigan quotes Colossians 3.12 from a new version, which comes from the Vatican, already a big problem, and he rips the verse totally out of context. In context, the verse is talking about putting on kindness, humbleness, meekness, and long-suffering, and is condemning quarreling with each other. And it's saying to put on charity, which means love or kindness or affection, and that is the bond of perfection. It's not saying we have to live sinlessly perfect, as he's trying to twist it to say. And we're being out of context. So, let's continue. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, in continuing with his non-dispensational heresy, he quotes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, a verse that is dispensationally during the thousand-year reign of Christ in the millennial kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is not for us today. During the thousand-year reign of Christ, Satan is bound in the bottomless pit. See Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. So, resisting sin will be a lot easier because you don't have Satan and the devils to basically cause problems and cause you to lust and that kind of stuff. Also, salvation during a time period is by works. Because you can't have faith because Jesus is physically on the earth. And faith is the evidence of things not seen. So if you can physically see Jesus, then there's no faith. So when he says you have to basically be pure in your heart to see God, yes, that is true. Because, you know, faith is the evidence of things not seen. You have that works. And also resisting the flesh will be easier because Satan is not there to tempt you. So, again, you know, going to different dispensations, have to go back to the Old Testament. You know, this is a problem when you don't rightly divide the word of truth. Which the modern versions don't teach, by the way. So, let's continue. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Your obedience is a sweet-smelling aroma to God. But wickedness is the stench in his nostrils. So Skelly, he quotes from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 to 2 in the new version, to say we have to be, quote, imitators of Jesus Christ. Let me show you what the King James says. Because the Catholic Church says this thing we have to be imitators of Christ. This is basically an anti-Christ doctrine. Because Satan in Genesis chapter 3 told Adam and Eve, you shall be his gods. So if we have to imitate Christ, we'd have to become Christ, which is exactly what Jesus Christ warned about in Matthew 24, those would be false Christs. But Ephesians chapter 5 in the King James, in the Word of God, says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. It doesn't say be imitators of Jesus Christ, as a modern Vatican perversions of the Bible make it seem. But Basically, and it says you have to be a sweet-smelling savior. Well, who's who's saying who is it saying has to be a sweet-smelling savior? You see, Skelly, he's making it seem like we have to be that sweet smell in God, and we have to taste good and whatever and weird thing he's saying. If you actually read the verse, it's saying that Christ is that sweet-smelling savior. Carrie and Skelly is making it seem like that's something we have to do, which is a work salvation. Basically, we have to work our way to heaven. We have to please God to get to heaven. No, Christ is that sweet-smelling savior. We don't do it ourselves, as he's twisting it and saying. So, let's continue. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. He became the author of eternal life to all those who obey him. Who obey him. Not those who disobey him, to those who obey him. So, another common verse, these sinless perfection work salvations will go to, is Hebrews 5 9. We see here, Kerrigan Scully quotes from Hebrews 5 9 to prove his work salvation sinless perfection. Hebrews chapter 5 verse number 9 is written to Jews. That's why the book is called Hebrews. Okay? Every single Paul and epistle, with the exception of Hebrews, opens up with basically people being in Christ. No word Hebrews anyone in Christ, because it's written to a different people for a different time period. Right now, when you're saved, you're in Christ. The book of Hebrews does not say you're in Christ. It's written to Hebrews, who are Jews, for the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 9 says you have to obey him for eternal salvation, because you can't take the mark of the beast. Revelation uh, 14, 12 says you have to keep the commandments. So, there is a sense of obeying you have to do. So it's not written for us today. It's written for Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But they always have to, run to, they have to run to different dispensations and mess around with those. So typical for them to quote Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 9. So let's continue. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake unto righteousness, Paul said, and sin not. Awake unto righteousness and sin not. So God has commanded this. John 5, 14. The man who's been healed by Jesus 
after being lame for 38 years. He said, go and sin no more. Lest a worse thing happen. If you go back to your sin or your stain in your sin, all that can happen to you is worse things, friends. All that can happen to you is worse things. So Skelly, he rips 1 Corinthians 15, 34 out of its context to prove sinless, sinless perfection. The context in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 condemns evil communications, and Paul is telling them to sin not in the sense of avoiding corrupt communications and evil communications. He's not saying sin not as in be sinlessly perfect, as this papist is trying to say. So again, totally taking it out of context to prove his heresy. Let's continue. John 8, 11, the woman called in adultery. Jesus said to her, Go and sin no more. Did he mean it? Did he mean go and sin no more? Or did he really mean go and sin some more? Or did he really mean go and sin a little bit less? No, go and sin no more. And typical of all sinless perfectionists to run to John 8.11, go and sin no more. The context of John 8.11 is the woman was caught in adultery, and when Jesus says to her, go and sin no more, he's saying that in the sense of don't commit adultery, stop committing adultery. He's not saying go and sin, sin no more as in stop sinning and be sinlessly perfect. That would be impossible, you know? But again, they always have to twist that verse to prove their sinless perfectionist heresy. John 8.11, John 8.11 is, is their go-to passage. But if you read it in context, it's saying simply just don't commit adultery. That's the context of it. But he has to twist it to prove his sinless perfection heresy. So, don't be deceived by this, this uh, Roman Catholic papist who thinks he's sinlessly perfect. It is wicked, and it is essentially um, you want to become your own God, because only God is sinless. So, and again, we only get an incorruptible body at the rapture. That's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 54. Our bodies are corruptible, and we only get an incorruptible body at the rapture. So don't be deceived by this sinless perfection, self-righteous heresy, and don't be deceived by work salvation Roman Catholics like Kerry and Skelly. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye.